Okay, so today is December 17th. Um, you ready, Eric? Yeah, it's all good? Okay, yeah. so today is uh, December 17th, Saturday at noon uh, Pacific time, and uh, we have uh, Eric Dollard uh, live on, a, on the uh, uh, video call here today. And this is the first uh, video call that we've done. In the past, it's always been the old school uh, phone conference calls, which works just fine. Uh, but this will save some time since this automatically records uh, a as a video. Um, and I might just have to add some URLs. Uh, in the past, it was pretty lengthy to have a uh, phone call, go through all the video editing and all that to make like a slideshow. But if there's any time that I need to bring up a image or uh, possibly if uh, uh, Griffin needs to bring up an image or something like that, we can also do screen sharing. And I think there's a whiteboard and all that business. So in any case, um, it's been uh, uh, a handful of months since we've done this live call. Um, just to get through a few announcements real quick, um, we are planning on having another conference um, at my shop uh, next uh, July. Uh, I think it'll be July 5th through the 9th, I believe. It's a Wednesday through Sunday. And it's the uh, basically the weekend that follows right after the 4th of uh, uh, July, which is on a Tuesday. It'll be here in Spokane, Washington. Uh, we haven't posted the schedule yet, but that will be available on energyscienceconference.com. And again, it'll be a five-day conference. Usually the first day will focus on health and wellness, and the rest of the days will kind of be grouped by themes. And Eric Dollard is planning on coming up to the next one. Uh, he was unable to be there in person for... Um, this year's conference uh, due to some uh, uh, health concerns, but uh, he'll probably be coming up to Spokane here in, in about uh, four months, and we're going to be working on the uh, uh, the rack project. Uh, basically, you probably have seen some of the videos where we have a, I have these uh, gray uh, Air Force racks, and uh, each of these bays, one is an audio one, one is an RF one. The audio one is, for the most part, pretty much done. Uh, there's just a little extra wiring that needs to be done and we have to uh, uh, get that tested and depending on how that goes that may be available to do uh, for some demonstrations at the conference and as time permits you know the RF Bay will be the next project that has a little bit more work to do. Um, on this call we're going to be talking a little bit about some of uh, the updates that's been happening down at EPD laboratories down in West Central Nevada uh, Eric will be covering uh, what's been going on with the uh, uh, these big uh, fuel tanks being used uh, for grounds uh, uh, for some of the the so-called uh, telluric uh, transmission uh, experiments that he's working on with uh, uh, Griffin Brock, uh, Haka says, and a couple other people. Uh, I think Steve Young and um, Stephen McGreevy, you know, at to some degree, they're they're involved with with these experiments as well. Um, <clears throat> there's a new book that's available. It's um, uh, the Law of Electromagnetic Induction and what is the name of the book, Eric? The it's the second second volume of uh, Heavy Sides: Electromagnetic Induction and Its Propagation. Okay, and that book is it, it's that being book put basically, on. That's basically Maxwell's equations demystified. Okay, and that book right here is, I'm going to see if I can um, maybe do a little screenshot here. Let's see, launch the previewer. Well, yeah, maybe I won't do that. But uh, in any case, it's on Amazon right now. It's not available live yet. There's a couple final edits that Simon Davies um, is uh, 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 helping me with. And that should be done uh, today. Uh, we already have the cover made. Um, so as soon as that looks good, um, I'll be able to order a proof copy, have one sent to Eric, and he should have that in his hands probably sometime next week, and I'll have a proof copy as well. So I can go over the, the phone with him on any, any final edits. And depending on how that goes, then that book should be available in paperback on Amazon by the end of the month. And that and part one will be available on emediapress.com as digital downloads, both part one and part two. And isn't part three, and, and Griffin has done a lot of work on the uh, uh, transcribing a lot of those notes into that. It's it's kind of, kind of been a heavy duty project. And then is there going to be a part three to that, to that book? Yeah. yeah. 
that, that, basic... book, that book that book goes along with the uh, presentation by the same title. Okay, and and that's basically been uh, two presentations so far. Is that the one with the Bach music, or is that was that the uh, Fortescue that's one? one? The Handel music that was like two, three years ago now, I believe. Okay, yeah, I think in twenty twenty at the uh, Kootenai County Fairgrounds in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, one or two years in a row, at least, there were uh, the two presentations, a heavy side one and a Fortescue one, and they both had musical elements to that. And those presentations are available on emediapress.com. And on emediapress.com, at the top right is a search box. And if you just type in um, Eric Dollard, you'll see all the different presentations under his name. Or if you search by category for Energy Science Technology Conference, or ESTC in 2020 or 2021, um, you'll you'll be able to see the videos categorized by year, and uh, so that that's kind of been a theme that's been going along with the the heavy side uh, presentations. And so, it, um, Griffin, is there any kind of timeline on that book three, or are you still working on the notes, or are you still writing that, Eric, or does Griffin no, no, have that's those long notes? Done. That's done. Okay, so yeah. that just has to be so that just has to be subscribed or uh, sorry, subscribed, transcribed, and uh, how long of a timeline do you think it'll be until those notes are ready uh, for like a final edit? I would say that possibly because um, with the scope of other projects coinciding at the same time, that typically just on a sit down basis, it could usually be accomplished in a month or two. Month or two. Okay, so probably by springtime, maybe March, maybe Possibly. end of it. Yeah, so if I have them in my hands at the beginning of March, then I'd say about a month to get it edited, put on Amazon, and it'll be a digital download and also a paperback on Amazon. Um, let's see. So now uh, EPD Laboratories, Inc. is a 501c3 nonprofit charitable corporation uh, based down in Nevada, which supports the work of Eric Dollard and a lot of these related projects. With, uh, that we're working on with uh, Griffin Brock, Haka says, uh, Dr. Adrian Marsh from the UK. Um, there's a handful of other people, uh, myself, and they're all kind of interrelated in one way or another. And the organization survives solely on donations. And if anybody is able to uh, make any donations to EPD Laboratories, Inc., it's greatly appreciated, no matter how big or small the donations. This pays the bills. This pays some of the government fees for some of the uh, land rights for some of the, uh, the projects coming together in regards to the seismic um, advanced seismic warning system uh, utilities. It's kind of expensive. We, we you know, um, Eric even pays for some of this out of his pocket for some people down in that area to help with the building. Some of uh, the work being done there, I am paying for out of donations out of the bank account. So we can take donations either by uh, check, money order, cashier's check by mail, or uh, by donations through PayPal. And if you go to ericpdollard.com, this is the official website. And if you look in the right column and scroll down, you'll see donation information. And if anybody can help spread the word, um, we, we do get some donations trickling in. Once in a while, there's a big donation that comes in and that kind of relieves some stress there. Uh, recently, there was a $3,900 donation by a certain trust, and that helped to cover some of the government fees um, and also some uh, uh, building insurance. You know, you, you're, you're looking at like a fourteen, fifteen hundred dollar bill per year that's you know due all at once. And so, fortunately, we're able to cover those. So again, EPD Laboratories Inc. It is um, all donations are tax deductible, and anything helps. So, do you want to go maybe right into uh, kind of talk, uh, describing uh, what the uh, uh, the fuel tank project kind of entails, describe kind of what it looks like, how the setup is in relation to the building and what and what you and Mickey have done to that over the last few months? Yeah. It's, uh, and its purpose. As of now, the unedited, unedited uh, or, or sorted photographs are on the website. They need to be distilled down. So, um, so the tanks... Uh, were converted to fire and flushing water tanks uh, many years back. And uh, much to my horror, I found out that the whole thing was just cobbed together and holes were cut in the tanks and pipes were chopped off. And uh, 
it was a complete nightmare to get the uh, watertight integrity again in the system. And, um, but we did it with uh, improper welder and ev everything was wrong. But, but we got it done. We got the tank sealed up. Uh, we have the, uh, the ground termination. We have the, uh, the liquid access to the tank so it can be used as a heat reservoir or a cooling reservoir to deal with some of the, uh, the heating and air conditioning here in the building, which is thoroughly non-existent right now. I mean, it's, uh, it was 28 degrees in this room when I got up this morning. So I got it to a nice comfy 38 now, but this, it's not really a lot of fun. But, uh, but that, that could work for that. So I have to make sure that anything I do here fits into a general plan so we couldn't just seal the tank up and what have you. We have to make sure that it was accessible to get to the water inside and to get that water in and out for various purposes, either firefighting or for uh, heating and ventilating uh, purposes. So the, um, the concrete sill, the gravel, uh, the welding of all the bastardization of the tank, all that's complete. Uh, the two poles are in to accommodate what's called the telluric test platform. I believe there's a drawing of that on the website. So there'll be a deck that the, uh, that the Tesla transformer or any related type of antenna bolts to, and then, uh, then an aerial capacity for holding up the, uh, the elevated electrodes or measuring electrostatic potential or any of that. So right now it's, uh, it's way too cold outside and everything's covered with snow. So that's kind of stalled, but the, um, but the hard part's all done. So the reason that that was possible was because somebody had donated $10,000. I'm doing the best I can to get started on this. And, uh, and uh, experiments were already done with the tank and it's kind of uh, a lot was learned. I don't know exactly. I think some of that is on YouTube. Uh, maybe somebody can tell me exactly where, but um, the situation uh, has turned out to be a lot more complicated. So the first tests were not encouraging, but, but a lot was learned. And uh, so now the next steps have to be taken. Uh, it's hard to say at this point because all theories have to be abandoned, and th this is a fresh start. We, we really don't know what Tesla was doing. The theory of electromagnetism is a contrivance at best, and uh, so this whole thing has to be approached with a completely open mind. And I'm just looking back to the original uh, expectations of Radio Corporation of America when they involved with me with this when I got out of the Navy is... Uh, come up with an improved form of uh, medium frequency and HF transmission that's 20 dB or better than anything that's presently available. And uh, right now, that's the objective. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to uh, share my screen and kind of point out uh, some of these links on the, the homepage uh, so everybody knows um, where to find those. Okay, hold on a second. Uh, let's see, share screen. Let me see if this works. Okay, is everybody seeing um, Eric's website right now? Yeah, that's good. Yep. It is? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is the homepage, ericpdollar.com. And in, I want to point out in the right column, yeah, if you scroll down, this is where the donation information is. If uh, anybody can donate by check or money order or cashier's check, they can send it to this address in Spokane, Washington. Uh, as soon as I receive that, I just endorse the check and I just forward it. I send it down to the uh, bank in Nevada. Uh, let's see. I know there's a PayPal link here somewhere. Okay, yeah. Scroll down a little bit more. You can uh, click this link. You can donate by PayPal. And then, um, and also if you want to write Eric a letter, uh, you can use the address below the PayPal link that goes to the uh, Tonopah, Nevada address. Uh, don't send the donations directly there. Um, 
But if you want to write a, uh, uh, a letter to Eric, that's the best way to communicate with him. And as long as it's not too crazy or outlandish, you'll get a, <laughs> you'll get a letter written back to you, uh, most likely. So on here, um, there's a couple, uh, uh, blog posts here. I think, uh, Griffin had put these up. Um, this is one where Eric is working out on the side of the building. So this is August. This is a few months back, uh, towards the end of the summer. And if you click, um, the read more directly below that picture where Eric's, uh, got a shovel or something, you can kind of see some of the, uh, work that Griffin is doing, uh, related to this. Here's some diagrams, not really any pictures of the, uh, fuel tank project. There should I be think right here. There should be, quite a, there should be quite a few of them. There should be almost a hundred. That's, the, that's in the photo section. Okay. In the photo section. Okay. Yeah, so because on, there were quite a few photos, so it had to be have its own section. Okay. So, so this right here, this blog post, Telluric Dash Research, this has a few uh, video clips. This is, I think, January of this year, uh, 11, 12 months ago, when uh, a bunch of us went down there and got a lot of work done. This is where the, uh, the first experiments are being set up and the transmitter and the coil and everything. Like you can see that Griffin's pointing this out. So if we go to the photo section under photos in the main menu bar, and then you scroll down. Uh, let's see. It's the second one, Telluric Radio Work. Okay, so this link right here, Telluric Radio Work at Tonopah Summer 2022. Um, if y'all click on that, then here's some, uh, let's see if this comes up like a gallery. Yeah, that worked pretty good. Let's see if I can. Okay. looks like I have to back out of it to, uh, okay. So you want to explain what this picture is, Eric? looks like the cover's off and you're at the top of the tank. Yeah, that's the, uh, the the hole that was cut in the tank and uh, and the cut off uh, vent pipe, which is at the uh, you can kind of see it sticking out of the dirt there, where the upper plank uh, crosses the lower plank, which is over the plywood covering the hole. You can kind of see the roundness of the tank. It's pretty good size. It's about fifteen thousand gallons. A little further away view. So this is a side of the building, and there's two tanks, right? There's like one over here and then one yeah, here. Yeah, one, one of them uh, was not molested or what have you, and so we have electrical access to that through its vent pipe. That's kind of a reference ground. And then this tank, uh, which is being worked on here in the photographs, which is on the same axis as the other tank, is... Uh, that's the one that's filled with water and, and what have you, and that's going to be the active ground. So, so the, comp the complication here is, uh, is that the ground is not ground anymore when you're doing this. The ground is hot. So you have to separate your station ground from your transmitting ground, which opens up a lot of complications. And then I have a major disaster <laughs> here is that the metal siding of the building is a uh, a parasitic shunt capacitance, which does not help the situation. And then to extremely aggravate it, the uh, electrical utility entrance is bonded to it. And the power utility uh, fiasco, which we're going through everywhere in this country now of connecting the high voltage neutral and the customer neutral means that the side of the building is connected to the high voltage power line. And that's gonna be very difficult to correct. So now uh, are both, and uh, both, uh, both uh, uh, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, both so, tanks are connected to these conduits into the side of the building, right? Yeah, one, yeah. one the, the first fitting, uh, basically, there was a uh, illumination gas lighting system in the town. And uh, that pipe, uh, by measurement, we found is cut off. So what's going to connect to that is what are called the zincs. Uh, this is something you usually use on, on ships is to prevent the corrosion. There's a block of zinc that gets welded to the side of the vessel, particularly where there's cavitation, like around the screws and what have you, and various uh, pump entrances and, you know, 
sea chests and all that have zinc. So that lead will connect to the zinc, which will help protect the uh, the tanks and all that from any further corrosion. And then, then the middle one goes to um, one of the tank vents, which comes up, uh, I think like you see these things, the gas station, there's a pipe that comes up out of the ground with a little head on it. So, so each tank has a vent, so the other two conduits are, are connecting to those vents, and that's how we were able to determine what kind of continuity. That, that's how we found that one of the pipes was cut off and, yeah. uh, and also found that uh, we have uh, a non-inductive uh, impedance to the earth here of one ohm, which is uh, exceptional, absolutely exceptional. So the, uh, the complication with the high voltage neutral is um, power company cooperation is required. Uh, outstandingly, uh, this utility company here has been very cooperative, is, uh, is fine with us having a delta delta connection and disconnecting the high voltage neutral and all that, but, um, but there's gonna be money required for that. They did, uh, they did do it for the electrical connection to the mine. They did not require any money. They did about fifty thousand dollars worth of work, and uh, and put it line to line. So we have a delta connection up there. So the the next problem now is to find a uh, a contractor to put in the terminal pole so they can connect the power. But uh, for some reason it just seems to be hard to get anybody to do anything anymore. So. I'm not getting too far on that. And then the big problem is going to be uh, where, where is the money going to come from for a project like that? Because that's kind of beyond, there's, there's the connection to the tank there. It's kind of beyond private donations. But um, one thing I need to point out, this is a, uh, this is a massive project. EPD Laboratories is a public utility in this town. And uh, we have responsibilities with our, our lines and poles and what have you. And also there is a lot of abandoned stuff here that we've inherited that, uh, that out of my own funding, I've been spending to take this stuff down off the power company poles and wires dangling over people's houses and all that. And, uh, and that has gone very well with the power company. So we did a lot of work for free that helped them. And now they're, they're helping us. And, uh, but this takes a lot of money. I mean, we got we got miles and miles of poles and wire out in the desert, and um, there just hasn't been enough. One facility, the Mojave facility, which was a secret one, and is related to Landers, had to be abandoned because it just simply isn't the funding for it. And uh, things are kind of sliding behind here, and about all I can really do much anymore with the money that's coming in is write books. So, which I think is more important than anything else right now, because uh, the understanding of electricity is completely vanished. So the present book I'm writing, which will be part of the upcoming presentation is uh, the Tesla four phase system. And then that will expand into a complete textbook on polyphase power, because there's no really useful explanations of polyphase power available right now. And the whole electrical utility system is going to hell because of it. And, and we will eventually open up for questions on this call. Um, now, on the right side, uh, Simon posted that link to the donate link, and I reposted it. Um, and let's see, I know that pe people are kind of, uh, let's see, there's a couple comments on here about going onto a podcast and that kind of stuff. Uh, a little hard to pay attention to while I'm trying to <laughs> juggle the controls of this call, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to those. Um, do you want me to open up for comment from... Uh, Griffin, Haka says, Dr. Marsh, or anything uh, on this, Eric, and see if there's anything else we want to cover and open up for questions. Yeah, well, let, me, let, me, let me kind of set it up. Uh, sure. <clears throat> so Griffin's kind of at the forefront right now because um, I really have no laboratory here. I've been here for 10 years now. Uh, I was brought here under false pretenses, as you well know, Aaron that uh, I was gonna get a laboratory and it turned out to be a scam. And uh, 10 years, no laboratory. So how much longer should I wait? So fortunately, uh, 
Griffin has uh, a fairly good setup. And uh, so we're moving forward on the uh, amplifier project, which is very important. So he's presently constructing a radically new amplifier design I came up with for his seismic warning system, <laughs> which right now, because he lives in Los Angeles, I think is the most important project of all. And then, uh, then of course, his work with the vacuum bulbs is outstanding. And we're attempting to get this uh, Tesla transmission thing hashed out. But that is extremely difficult because of all the tedious experiments. You have to wind coils and then fool with them. Um, I think the... Uh, the theoretical basis for this now has been hashed out by the experiments we did here last time, which makes things incredibly more complicated. Uh, there is still no uh, way to mathematically derive the characteristic impedance or the propagation constant of an isolated solenoidal coil. So that's kind of the big holdup. So at this, this point, I'll let Griffin take over. Okay. Yeah, That's so that actually correlates into... Uh, part of Adrian's work, which he presented on this conference, last conference. Now, a couple days ago, I was experimenting with the telluric test bed, which pictures of that is on my website. And until recently, I was experimenting with single resonant coils. And of course, the various phase alignments of the potential and current nodes alongside these coils. And with aid of Mr. Hakases, that we've been able to take certain vector network analysis measurements of these coils. And by doing these recent experiments, I noticed that there's a correlation between the series mode, which is intended for telluric transmission, and that of the fundamental parallel mode, which is typically the wasted or the radiated Hertzian component to a coil. And I'm sure Mr. Uh, Dr. Adrian Marsh could elaborate more on that. But nonetheless, these two modes seem to correlate with the series and parallel mode alignments. And I was able to graph some detailed analysis of this on my website where the phase alignment of the current and potential nodes will typically be in phase for the series mode operation or frequency. And for the parallel mode, which is the radiated or wasted mode, that the two potential and current nodes will typically be out of phase similar to a 180 degree phase shift, but usually a little less. So because this is kind of a recent discovery and this does coincide with work done by colleague caucuses as well, that we could concur on these findings and this may be a path to determining just the efficient telluric mode of transmission for a coil. You wanna talk about the amplifiers a bit? Yeah, it's so the- the containers are doing and the right. nature of your Granite Brown? So, yes. So unfortunately, because of my current location being near the San Gabriel Mountains, that I live on a, on a um, how should I say, an alluvial flat. And because of the circumstances, the surrounding soil is not necessarily a great conductor. It's rather an insulator because of the high granite content. So that doesn't exactly make conditions quite favorable. But nonetheless, about three, four months ago, I have it also on my website where we, my, a friend of uh, myself, mine, that we were able to establish a very extensive ground system for telluric research. And this cons uh, consisted of two 50 gallon barrels stacked on top of each other and welded shut to create this elongated 6.8 foot cylindrical mass, which was filled with water. So this acts as a pretty good capacitive earth terminal. And of course, I built a telluric test platform, which was a half scale model of the drawings that Eric had sent me and which Aaron was able to show quite recently. So using this along with other ground terminations and flat top antennas situated atop my laboratory, I have adventured upon a more elaborate electrodynamic seismic warning system, which I first presented at the 2020 conference uh, energy science technology conference that is and this system consists of more elaborate receivers detection equipment and chart recording equipment so that on a second based interval we could see what the relative seismic activity is 
via the ionosphere and Earth waveguide, along with the telluric component, which is kind of the more abstract or dynamic component to electrodynamic seismic forecasting. And this typically adheres itself to nearby field or nearby activity regions. So granted, I am in California. This situation presents itself quite clearly as seismic activity happens on a regular basis. And of course, this type of system would make sense because this would allow me to detect prior to the big one that everybody claims will happen soon and essentially give precursor warning to that event. So all detail of that extensive project, which is primarily funded by donations and has been able to sustain itself, is posted on my website and also on my YouTube page where I give a walkthrough video of what the setup is currently. Hey, Griffin, in the uh, uh, message chat on the side of the screen, can you type in your website address so everybody knows how to okay. get there? Okay. I posted my website address. It's simply my full name, griffingbrock.com. And under that website, then you're able to see the YouTube channel in which I post somewhat regularly with updates and videos of just what work is being conducted with the seismic amplifier as well as one of my favorite research fields is with high vacuum and high frequency. And there's a PayPal donate link on Griffin's website. Yes. Dr. Marsh, do you want to jump in on anything, or Haka says, or? Yeah, sure. I'll add on the, some progress yeah. on the on the three coil system. Um, uh, since the ESTC, um, when we all talked about um, uh, the transatlantic project, um, I've developed the the three coil telluric system. So whilst Eric and Griffin are working hard on the one coil um, system, so um, I've been working hard on the three coil. Um, we presented some um, network analysis um, on those. And again, the series mode and the parallel mode um, are tunes. Um, we're all working on the around about the 1.86 megacycles at the moment. Um, I mean, we have plans to go lower. Obviously, Tesla was working a lot lower than that, um, but this is a good starting point. So the three-coil system from uh, the UK side um, is now tuned and set up. Um, it, has, uh, it can be tuned for the series and the parallel mode um, at 1.86 megacycles. Um, it has a ground system, which at the moment presents around about a 5-ohm impedance um, at the frequency. Um, it can go down slightly if it's irrigated. It's a pumped water system, so I can actually pump water down into the ground actively, um, and it, 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 it irrigates the ground system around, around the electrodes. Um, so uh, if you imagine like a copper pipe system, um, and the water can be pumped down um, into the ground, um, and that reduces the impedance by about a factor of two. Um, as you irrigate it. So there is a, there is a lot of work on my uh, website on the two coil uh, telluric system. And I'm gonna repeat, probably come January, I will uh, repeat the three coil system um, from the same places. So at the moment, um, the two coil system, I could go to about uh, the telluric results um, to about 30 miles. 35 miles um and when i went up to about 100 miles um at the beach then i didn't get a result there so i'm looking to improve that with the three coil system uh the advantage of the three coils it gives uh, it gives a selectable um lmd cavity um between the extra coil um and the secondary um and it allows multiple modes to be tuned so you have about you have about five or six different modes um, that you could tune with the three coil over the two coil. And I will probably in January repeat the same field trips. Um, so first of all, it's uh, 30 miles and then also up to 100 miles. And if those are successful, um, then 
obviously we're looking to link those uh, that experiment between uh, the UK um, and the US. Uh, see if we can if we can do that groundbreaking experiment of actually getting a telluric um, communication between um, transatlantic. I know Eric you, that you uh, when we spoke. I mean you've 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 seen that across all of America from one side of America to the other. So in principle, I think I think it should be possible. Do you want to add some more, Eric, on that? Well, the, uh, there's somebody over there named Bruce Gavin that has been doing this. I don't know if you can get his cooperation. But at any rate, he, he achieved about 1,500 miles. Oh, that's good. 1.8 megacycles. And try, trying to get your signal to California, I think, would be unreasonable. If somehow... You can contact him and see if he's willing to work with you on it. That would greatly increase the probability of success. Do you think and, so? And as you know, he was he was the one that built the Colorado Springs scale model. So this guy is mm -hmm. quite adept at putting this stuff together. Yeah, I did. I I remember that retreat well. I remember that he was there and then he wasn't. So um, I don't know about that. Um, but but I mean, how about um, how about the uh, from the UK to Tonopah? Do you think that's possible? Uh, I think it'd be best to try coast to coast if you can get somebody on the other side of the country to cooperate. Yeah, here, here would be more. Well, I don't know. I mean, we're you know we're in the blind on this. So, but um, right now, I think. Uh, Tonopah is probably going to be more between like here and Griffin or uh, mm -hmm. another person that's working on this. It has an installation in Arizona, Steve Young. Uh, uh, it would probably be one of those two. Yeah, so close. Maybe, maybe, maybe Steve McGreevy because he's actually very close. He's in the same geology. But um, so hey, being, like that, being that I'm 70 years old, you know, um, I, I can't be waiting around another 20 or 30 years for any of this stuff. So I'm part of what's called the do it now generation. Either we get it done or we go on and do something else. I agree. I agree fully. Hey, uh, Haka says, did you have something you wanted to jump in on? Uh, I guess just a couple of things. Uh, so post-conference, as Adrian said, we were trying to do the, the transatlantic to Lurik uh, communications, but of course things become more complicated when you actually try to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was, uh, around that time, I was working on a, a very good ground system. And uh, my thinking was that, oh, you just drill a borehole down, you know, 30, 40 feet, hit the water table, get a nice low impedance, everything will work perfect. Uh, lo and behold, uh, both with the, the crash course I was lucky enough to do with Eric in uh, August and uh, my follow up when I finally finished it. Uh, the interesting thing, of course, was that the DC resistance uh, was only about two ohms. Uh, to the uh, very major electrical ground, but the impedance, it turned out to be just as bad as a single ground rod, about 50 to 70 ohms. Mm -hmm. So uh, I learned in that, that I, uh, the importance of the ground is much more on surface area than on the sheer conductivity. Uh, unfortunately, of course, that means I had to go back and re, uh, revisit my ground system. So I have a plan in motion, but uh, of course the day job intrudes. So you know, you get on the road for a month, you don't have any time to mess with that. And of course, you know, Christmas and all that comes through, but uh, working for it, uh, hopefully in the near future, I get uh, a better ground situation going and I can do some better tests with that. Uh, in addition, uh, I did, uh, while I was on the road, I did have an opportunity to do some vector network analysis uh, of one of the same coil systems we present, uh, we were experimenting in Tonopah. Uh, on a marine vessel of a large size. So we actually were able to, to do some rough experiments with a ground plane that was about 50,000 square feet. And uh, it's, I, I didn't have time to finish it, but the rough idea was that it was comparable or actually a little bit better uh, with no optimizations or anything than Eric's. I think Eric's, the best we measured live was 12 ohms and I got down to almost 10. So it's one of those things, of course, you know, it was just a one-off, uh, but uh, it was promising for me because it helped show that the surface area was more important than, uh, than direct resistance. So at least it gave me a direction to go in. 
So hopefully we're going in the right direction. Right. It seems as though that we're also um, we're also looking forward to that um, that uh, reception when you want the ship, when the whole ship becomes the ground plane. <laughs> yeah, when we do the, uh, the the hard part is coordinating these, but I do hope to do, to have a receiver station running when Adrian's doing the transmit because that's about the the best closest ideal you could get for this type of a test. Oh, that'd be good. So what we're going to try to do here is um, is put a uh, a regular beacon transmitter on the air and have this thing keyed twenty four hours a day. Uh, I have the, um, oh, I don't know what you would call it. I have a 1,500-watt Navy transmitter that was left out in the desert for 20 years by an idiot, uh, the same idiot that left Aaron's Collins out in the desert for 20 years. But we got Aaron's Collins working, so I do have all the pieces to uh, to get this thing put together. Uh, I don't really have any help here. That's part of the problem. And I don't really have all the necessary space or access to the parts or any of the things. So there's a lot of impedances involved. But um, but at any rate, that's the objective, to get a regular keying going on 1.8 megacycles. And then because it's on 24 hours a day, then people can experiment with it when, uh, when it suits them. And... Uh, We'll see where it goes from there. I don't know exactly when that will happen, but uh, but that's the plan. So once the Telerik test platform's done, then uh, we'll probably have to make another set of coils. I'm not quite certain about that yet. And um, this thing is re what I what I've found out. There's a couple of uh, of uh, complications. So in uh, talking with Adrian some time back and kind of my visualization of this, of this stuff is uh, the regular AM radio station ground plane might not be desirable because it might just suck all the lines of force out of the coil. It mm, really, yeah. a, a, a root type structure would be better. Uh, a well, of course, is, uh, is something like that. But the problem is, is the length of the pipe, if it's not completely encased in a conductive or highly in, in Griffin's case, a highly inductive medium, uh, that length will act as an impedance and defeat any access to the ground. So, so that's uh, one complication. The other complication is, is there has to be an admittance on the high side of the coil that has a reciprocal relationship to the impedance on the low side of the coil, which relates to the characteristic impedance of the coil to make the coil operate exactly one quarter wavelength long and that cannot be those characteristics of the coil cannot be accessed mathematically as of yet so um, i'm encouraging griffin to start with uh, an analog computer using lump components is basically a pi network such as a uh, am radio station would use between the transmitter and uh, maybe a halfway vertical but then we have to get all the parts and uh, and what have you. So so there's going to be most likely there's going to be a critical elevated capacity that uh, that is reciprocal to the impedance in the ground. And if that's achieved, then I expect this thing may take off. But uh, that will involve a lot more experiments. And it's very difficult when you know you have to keep building a coil for each and every different thing. It's uh, it's very labor intensive and I do not have the facilities here to do that myself. So I have to rely on other people, but I do have the one ohm ground and I do have the pieces to assemble the Navy transmitter. And we managed to get the uh, three phase power going, which they had a bad main breaker. So now there's 240 to run the transmitter. So that was a step forward. The, the objective here, I have a pair of AM radio transmitters, five kilowatts was to get our FCC frequency allocation on 500 kilocycles and go full bore with this thing. Uh, those frequencies are pretty much not used. Uh, at some point very soon here, we're going to have to get the right, uh, right expertise in here. We have to start getting FCC allocations for this stuff. We can't just be fooling around and transmitting everywhere. And the ham bands are not particularly useful because mm. the hams, uh, 
hand bands are kind of like trying to use the bathroom in a Greyhound station. Uh, it just doesn't work out. You know, they trash your but uh, they just simply don't cooperate. And they're part of the Fred Flintstone Club. So we have to get out of the hand bands, particularly being what hand bands exist in these lower frequencies are severely limited in power. And uh, none of this is really feasible unless you operate with a five kilowatt transmitter. Uh, another, another. We are, uh, Eric, Eric, we are going to have to get to the lower frequency, though. I think for this telluric work, we are going to oh, yeah. have to get to the lower frequency. Yeah, we got to. Uh, well, <sighs> you know, tes Tesla and Alex Anderson were in agreement that the right frequencies for this are between 10 and 30 kilocycles. Yeah. But mm -hmm. those coils start to get kind of big. Huge. Yeah. Huge. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I'm just thinking to my original relationship with RCA, and and there are certain Navy interests in this, is uh, let's just see what we can do with the uh, bottom end of HF or the top end of medium frequency and go from there. Because if, if there is a, uh, particularly for in a case of like island to island communications in the Pacific, where there's complications and having big antenna arrays and all that. If, if it can be something that works in this band, the, the about 520, say about 520 kilocycles. Yeah. Somewhere around there or, or what have you then, or even, even up to three megacycles. Cause I, I had good luck all the way to seven megacycles in Bolinas. I was able to transmit from uh, Bolinas to Los Angeles, which is 500 miles on seven megacycles. Yeah. Wow, that is no, something. No aerial conductor whatsoever. Wow, but that's something. But Bolinas is a special place, so that, that might not happen anywhere. But, but at any rate, there's millions of islands in the Pacific that desire some kind of non-disruptable communications for basic you know, purposes, not, nothing you know, high-speed digital or anything. And if it's possible to come up with some kind of borehole and then a, a mounted coil and an elevated capacity that gets a good signal from island to island, uh, there is a, allegedly a demand for that. So uh, basically, I don't care if it's Tesla or Alex Anderson or Marconi or who it is, if it's 20 dB stronger than a conventional HF antenna array, then that's all I care about because I'm very goal orientated with this stuff. All I care about is what works. I'm not going to get involved in a sea of theory or uh, spend way too much money on experimentation if there's shorter ways to go about this. Well, the advantage, if we can get plus 20 dBs, then we can also get some revenue in as well. What's that now? Well, it means if we can get plus 20 dBs, we can also get some funding. <laughs> <laughs> well, the bandwidth, the bandwidth is not going to be more than regular telephone or AM radio station bandwidth. Now, the Alexanderson antenna, the improvements I've made on the Alexanderson antenna can have up to 30 kilocycles of bandwidth. That's unheard of. But that's a more elaborate structure. And uh, I have not been able to get that's, that project requires major funding. So I have, uh, I have three facilities available to me. I have five miles of, uh, of H loaded telephone buried cable in the Mojave. So H loading means the cable comes to the surface every 6,000 feet. I have at the same location, um, one mile of aerial conductor. At this location, I have also one mile of aerial conductor, but the, uh, the harmonics from NV Energy are so strong that to lurk reception out of the ground at the voice frequency band is not possible, but Alexanderson transmission in the very low frequency band is possible. So I have three facilities, but these are major projects that have to move in $25,000 steps, and I'm just not getting that. So fortunately, $10,000 that $10, was supplied was enough to do this tank and telluric test platform project and get some kind of coil constructed. It's not cheap to do these things. It can, it's told. quite expensive when you're dealing with this on a public utility level. You know, it's not a hobby shop thing anymore. We're dealing with a major, you know, advancement in uh, electrical knowledge here. That's been, uh, oh, one thing I did want to point out, 
is uh, on the subject of electrical knowledge and its uh, detractors is coincidentally when I started writing, uh, which I'm working on now, writing on the Tesla four phase system, which is uh, has a lot of unique characteristics that three phase does not. And that's why it's been used uh, like in communications for color TV and FM radio and sideband generation, uh, servo systems, all kinds of things, four phases. Uh, as I started writing this, I usually learn more myself in the writing than probably the people that have read it. And it's four phases, fascinating. Well, coincidentally, at this exact moment I started this, this Einstein sycophant called Kathy Loves Physics and History starts her slander of Nikola Tesla on YouTube. And uh, I actually became so outraged that I couldn't concentrate on my work for two or three days. And this woman is something else. Everything is racist and Tesla was an idiot and he was a con man. And uh, am I still here? Yeah, you are. I'm just pulling up a, a, a post in Energetic Forum that Griffin put in there about it that I didn't know about. I just ran, ran across it and it made me laugh because I know we were talking about that. But uh, uh, Gr Griffin posted this um, December 7th in EnergeticForum.com. This is, uh, if you go to energeticforum.com, it's free to join. And in the renewable energy section in the Eric Dollard official forum, uh, Griffin posts under GG Brock. And this is called a YouTube channel predicament, Eric Dollard's reply. This has a link to the video and you can go in there and uh, read this. But this is <laughs> Eric's response to the video on YouTube. So I just wanted to share that. But yeah, go ahead, Eric. It, it can get worse, and it probably will, because when I get worked up, it's dangerous. Things actually can fly. So, um, But at any rate, uh, I've already written on the subject. Uh, there's a book that, a booklet that's out on Amazon. Uh, it's called Revival of the Science of Electricity in the Digital Age. And its uh, companion is the electrical utility in the digital age, which uh, we all know is swirling rapidly down the toilet bowl and it's getting ready for the final burp. So I thought it was important to write on those subjects and the, uh, the power company foreman here really liked it. So that was encouraging and that helped with my relations here. So, so even though the revival of science might only be like 15 or 20 pages, I had to read 10,000 pages of material to get all the little gems and put them in a sequence. So I did this in the, uh, the forests up in Oregon where I live in my car in the summer and uh, spent every day on it. And, uh, and I'll tell you, it's from the mouths of all the experts, from, you know, Hertz and, uh, and Tesla and Steinmetz and all these guys, J.J. Uh, Thompson and uh, the... Einsteinian understanding of electricity that's being shoved down our throat today and the electron theory and all that type of stuff is completely inimical to any advance whatsoever in the science of electricity. So, so this booklet kind of is like the, uh, the skeleton in the cave whose finger is pointing the way out. Okay. <laughs> Hey, Eric, some good. If anybody remembers that movie with James Mason, uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth, it's a classic. <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so, Eric, good news. There's ni there's 90 people on this uh, call right now. Wow. So that's I think that that's that's more than we've ever had on uh, any of the live calls, which I think well, the max might have been 30. Video. Being video helps a lot. Yeah, it's easy for a lot of people, and they yeah. can. Uh, just click a link and uh, dial in. Um, are you ready to go, go over any uh, questions? And all, yeah. and all four of you can answer if anybody wants I, to direct a question. We, the, the only thing that uh, that hasn't been uh -huh. covered yet that's important in this is uh, Adrian's uh, golden ratio discharge work. So no, no one prior has duplicated that work that I did at my laboratory at the Marconi station in Bolinas, but Adrian has got the, uh, he's got them right on other than uh, there are some advancements that need to be done. So some more experiments 
uh, are necessary. We've talked about that to determine the formation of these things and, you know, what their time sequences are and what have you. And, and also, uh, Griffin has made incredible advancements in the uh, Tesla radiant matter bulbs. We've been talking about that. And uh, so we're, we're looking at, uh, despite what uh, Kathy loves, history, physics, and Einstein is uh, thinking uh, this is a, a big move forward in the understanding of the works of Nikola Tesla, because now it's starting to become a reality. It's engineerable and, uh, and solid engineering uh, basis is being established for this stuff. Can everybody see those pictures? I can see them. You can see them. Okay, they're showing. Aaron, just go back to the previous one, huh? The first one. Uh, first one, right there. No, back. Yes, here. Now you see uh, what Eric is, no, forward. Here. Um, what Eric is talking about, if you look at uh, what's on the screen here, this is from ESTC 2022. And if you look at some of those, um, those fractal fern discharges, um, this is something that um, Eric first observed um, in the 70s. I mean, I thought it was the 90s, but when I spoke to him about it, no, it was actually the 70s. Um, and no one had actually, Eric, was 1978, huh? Yeah, about 1978. And, and nobody has seen this thing, these things since. But if you look at that picture, and there are a lot more of these pictures on my website, if you're interested to see more of this, um, then please go to my website at aminnovations.com. Um, Aaron, if you could put that in the chat, that would be great. Um, but the, if you look at the, uh, the discharges on the screen, um, first of all, look at that one in the top right. Look at the symmetry of that. I mean, how many times have you seen an electrical discharge which is symmetrical in that way? Um, look at the one in the bottom left. There's actually two discharges there wound around each other. If you look at the one in the bottom right, you actually see the extinction, the extinction of a charge, um, um, uh, of a discharge. I mean, there is a, what we are researching here is the underlying nature of electricity. So, so mm -hmm. there is an underlying order. I mean, we've heard about fractals, we've heard about nature, we've heard about fractals in nature, but we are also demonstrating this underlying order is, of course, is within electricity. Um, and um, electromagnetism is not going to tell you about anything about that at all. It's this, this kind of thing is unheard of. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a self-repeating, um, self-similar um, geometry. Um, which appears in electricity under the right conditions. Um, and we have established what those conditions are. So this is a, this is a major research project that we're, we're, we're underway at the moment. Um, just what Aaron is showing now. I mean, these are, these are the um, demonstration system that I used in 2022 and connected to some of the bulbs that uh, Griffin uh, developed. So we wanted to try a, on the spot experiments so this is the coil um and it looks like a regular tesla coil i mean just a conventional tesla coil there's nothing special about it um it's a it's a five to one ratio it's designed to have lots of um, um uh, voltage magnification for discharge it's got nothing golden ratio about it um and it's driven from um, a modulated os a low frequency modulated oscillator. Um, that's the that's the equipment that. Um, so on the left there, you have a you have a the high tension power supply, and on the right you have the tube supply, um, which is basically a it's a class C in this mode. It's a class C Armstrong oscillator, um, and that's driving that coil. And this picture here shows Eric's original picture. Um, um, Eric, I presume that was 1978. You took this picture. No, that one's that one's at the Integratron. That would be about 1984. 
Okay, so 1984, yeah. this one on the left, and then the result that we got here on the right. And if you now start looking, look at the look in detail, look at the primary tendrils, look at the secondary tendrils, look at their positioning. I mean, there is order here. I mean, those discharges, I mean, obviously the the photography is different. One is an analog photography, the other is a digital. Um but if you look at where the tendrils bifurcate out of each other, they are essentially in the same positions. It has, it has, it has order. It has a natural order. Um, and this is, this is about the relationship between the, uh, the magnetic field of induction and the dielectric field of induction, things that Eric defines fundamentally um, at the beginning of his work and throughout the whole of the 60 years that he's been working, those the relationship between those two induction fields has an underlying order. And what we are working to demonstrate is that this underlying order is a part of, of life's natural order. And that's a, that's a massive thing. That's a huge step. So electricity is not just something that comes out of the socket. Um, it is not something which is just generated um, because you, you know, we use whatever method to heat to steam. We drive a turbine, which drives a generator, and out comes electricity. Electricity is a fundamental part of nature, um, and then there is an underlying order in that, um, and that is what we are working to uncover. And since 1970s, when Eric first saw it, and now. Um, I mean, that's, that's almost 40 years. Nothing's really been done on this research. So we are making great strides forward. Hopefully next year we'll have a lot more time um, to have a look at these things, um, to do some work together. Um, as Eric was referring to, um, there is, there's, there's, you ask the question, how does that discharge actually create? How do you get that? What is the relationship between the magnetic induction field and the dielectric induction field i mean we worked out what the fundamental characteristics are in order to be able to generate this you need three things you need you need to resonate at a frequency at a pure frequency over 1.5 megacycle you need to combine it with modulation which is at low frequency say particularly typically under 200 hertz and you need to add it with some with, with an envelope, with a generator envelope, um, which um, yields to a very high magnification um, in the Tesla coil. You put those three things together, and then you get this form of discharge. So, I mean, Eric, do you want to add more? You probably you probably know more. Uh, do you want to add more to I mean what we're exploring here? Yeah, it's uh, it's a golden ratio uh, relationship. It uh, it seems to, uh, if I remember right, it it's uh, it's basically a five pointed system, but it leans towards six. Mm -hmm. And um, and one of the most fascinating things is is when the power goes through the uh, the cutoff point, it's rectangular wave modulated. I think it's probably a typical duty cycle is about maybe ten or fifteen percent. Mm -hmm. So. It, they, they're they're best when they they go off at about five five per second because then you can see what's going on. Is uh, I think is it's about position, ten percent. It's 10%? about ten. Yeah, okay. it, it, it's about ten in that demonstration. Yeah. So so for any given discharge, the discharge that preceded that discharge and the discharge that follows that discharge also present themselves relative to each other in a circular division of five. So how does it know what, what, what is carried through time? How, is, how does this thing know? How does the next discharge know after space is completely deionized and the power has been gone for 10 times the pulse width? How does it know what shape and where to be? Yeah. We're, we're dealing with the fundamental, you know, when I discovered this stuff at the RCA station in Bolinas, uh, at that point, I was known as the wild man of Bolinas. Uh, I was a completely feral human, barefoot in the forest. Uh, you never know where I would pop out of the bushes. It really freaked out the assholes. That was encouraging. 
and uh, covered with berry stains and stickers. All of a sudden, I would leap out onto the street. <laughs> that's a little, no, that's a side, that's a side spending, story. Huh? I was spending all my time, you know, as a raw food vegan through the redwoods and the conifer forests, and everything that I saw in that forest was presenting itself when I got back to my laboratory in that discharge. Well, the forest was a massive symphony of discharge. And that really struck me. That was one of the, the idyllic things and the tragedy of its loss was the Marconi Bolinas transmitting station sits on a massive ley line. The voodoo there is absolutely outrageous. I mean, you could have you know, a mosquito farts worth of power and you can get a signal all the way across the Pacific with it. And one of the most beautiful spots in the world and it's been lost to the swines of the earth. It's just, uh, I still wrench this day. But at any rate, getting off of that. Um, now these discharges can be manipulated by using a, uh, a master oscillator power amplifier and having, I wrote this in my uh, condensed intro to Tesla transformer. It's an old, old paper, uh, Borderland got a hold of it and it's out public domain now. When I lost my Bolanus laboratory and I met Philo Farnsworth, who was really a major influence in getting started in all this stuff, particularly the mathematical end of it, not having any laboratory anymore, and then you know, he handed me some books and he said, okay, well now you do it with mathematics. And also, um, let's see, I kind of lost my point now because there's too many things going on. What was it's, about the, it's about the discharges, how they form. Yeah, the discharges. Um, yeah, I, I can't remember now, I lost that one. It, it'll come back to me. But, it, oh yeah, uh, so the, um, Getting back to the, the modulation, so that's what. The, so when Philo uh, handed me one of his father's television laboratories ink notebooks that was blank, and handed it to me and said, "Write down everything that you did in your laboratory in the Marconi building," and that was that exists now as what's called the condensed intro to the Tesla transformer. And what I had shown in there is by using a feedback mechanism to, to modulate the frequency and fine tune it into what the coil or no, what the discharge wants to see, it might be possible to enhance these discharges to take on even more organic and more complicated shapes. So, so presently, this is what's getting built up at Aaron's place, but it's a very tedious, arduous project, and it's out of my neighborhood, which makes it even more difficult. But nevertheless, um, it's a beautiful spectacle to see. Uh, the Bolinas Tesla transformer has been reconstructed now. And uh, so the next step is getting the, uh, the necessary RF power to the thing. And uh, so the objective this time around, assuming that everything works out, is presently with the Collins, we have 100 watts, but I think without too many complications and operating this thing in a, in a partial coil mode, which we have been doing for the cosmic light bulb, uh, there'd be no problem getting it up to 1500 watts with audio modulation. So the, the flame speaker, the flame will be three times as long because the length of the flame goes up with the square root of the power. And the cosmic light bulbs can get agitated to the point which they will viciously explode, even though they have a vacuum in them. So the complication right now is getting the guy that's in the vicinity to start making these tubes and what have you. And then I got to get up there and see how far I can go with all this. So that's the objective there. So hopefully by July, we will have this thing operating at 1500 watts and uh, which could do some of the fractal discharges, but the coil configuration for doing that, we don't have the, the transmitter built for that yet. It was out of the frequency range of the column, so that really delayed a lot of things. So right now, I think it's just the flame speaker and the cosmic light bulb. If we can get to that point, the next step there, that would be good.
Well, we've got the we've got the AM Innovations equipment. Um, um, Aaron has that also, um, so we can we can utilize some of that as well. We got the coil there. I mean, we should just no. Get this, is, this is different. This is. Uh, but I mean, we should be able to drive that coil from from your from your two racks and get a much bigger discharge. No, but, but the thing is, is is what you have is self oscillating, and that we have to run with the master oscillator. Yeah, that's so, true. That's true. We have to run. So see, see, that that's the next step. There's a lot a lot of advancements that need to be done in this over conventional. First of all, microwave transformers are flea power. Uh, the other the other problem is is because of uh, the save money and let it burn policy of, uh, of technology today is the inductance coils are no longer present where they're supposed to be. Uh, and you can't really find these things anymore. It was an absolute miracle that the thing that I'm building for air, we were able to find all of the necessary inductance coils, including the radar modulation choke. This, and that modulation transformer truly was a gift from Jesus. Oh, this stuff yes. does not exist anymore. And it's yeah. heavy and it's difficult to deal with. The other thing is, is everybody's using half wave for the RF. And that really, you can't get the power out of the tubes with half wave. You, you have to go full wave. And for, for using two tubes in parallel versus two tubes in push pull, uh, you have, you, it's uh, 1.5 times more power out of that pair of tubes. And then you have to have an oscillator to drive the tubes, and then that oscillator has to have, if there's going to be any feedback, the oscillator has to extract that and sample it from the coil. But I found it's best to drive it from a, a special a high-resolution analog master oscillator so that you can tune into the different aspects of that discharge because you go to one side and the other side, they start doing different things. Mm -hmm. uh, the the half-wave self-oscillating method is expedient, and what have you, but it's not efficient and you have no control over, over the frequency. So the thing that Aaron, Aaron's getting is full blow, blown. It's pulse, FM, AM, and all at once. That's why, and it's, and it's mil spec. And that's why this thing is taking a long, long time to put together. It's, a, it's an absolutely massive project. Now, I've try, I tried doing this at Bolinas and uh, everything got trashed. So that was the years of work down the drain. And then I managed to do it again at the Integratron, and uh, and that got taken away from us. And then uh, so I set up a laboratory in Santa Barbara, and then I built a really big one. Uh, I think the only available witness to it uh, might be Peter Lindemann. Uh, the discharges were enough to have people would run in terror from the garage, and it could be the music could be heard a mile away that, that's how big this operation was and then uh the funding got cut off and uh and four years of work and uh fifty thousand dollars worth of materials was scattered to the wind one more time so now uh i got this place but uh i have no support to do anything like that here so aaron has started one of his own so now this is the third try so we have to say it's now or never that's right. Now, now in May, I turned 70 years old, and the exact same week, my odometer on my Toyota Corolla rolled over 700,000 miles. Okay? Is to date, I've been here 10 years, and I still don't have a laboratory. So should I complain? I'll, I'll leave that to uh, others to decide. So that's all basically other than I can describe some of the stuff that Aaron's showing. So that's that's the amplitude modulator output tubes, a pair of 810s. They'll develop about 600 to 700 watts of audio power. And uh, this is the um, putting together the the special uh, exciter for the coil with all of its elements operating. It's made out of um, Army Air Corps uh, 100 watt transmitter. I think it's a, I forget what it is, BC 375 or something like that. So fortunately um, in my inventory of GLOM, uh, I had uh, several, several tuning units out of that. 
and then uh, then the transmitter is being assembled with more economical vacuum tubes because you can't get the tubes, nor would you have the space to put that stuff in. That was one of the big complications was uh, 10 pounds of shit and five pound bag here, getting all that stuff in the rack was, uh, boy, it took some figuring. I'll tell you, it took some real figuring. <laughs> so at any right. rate, it looks good. And, uh, and the Voodoo was good. We were able to find all matching Westinghouse uh, Navy meters, World War II ruggedized meters, all the right scales, no funky scales, you know, that you have to put multipliers on, all the right transformers, all the right chokes. Uh, this thing, I mean, I would estimate it probably has 3,000 to 5,000 screws, nuts, and washers alone in it. <laughs> yeah, yes, it does. <laughs> it's a work of art. And, and this project, um, those two, uh, the RF and the audio system, that was all funded out of my pocket. So no, no donations from EPD Labs went to that. that. That was all personally funded. So, but if anybody wants to donate, donate, donate anything this way, it's it did cost a fortune. Um, well, that's that's the problem here. You know, it's, it takes a lot of money to do this stuff, and uh, and what's discouraging to me is I don't have anything here. You know, will I ever have my own? I don't know. I got these two beautiful AM transmitters sitting here. And uh, but no way to run them. And I got... Uh, Those are five kilowatts, uh, Eric. Those transmitters. They're, yeah, they're, they're, they're five yeah. kilowatts, huh? Yeah, and, well, they have two distinct uh, uh, uses. So they also have... Each one has a three kilowatt audio modulator. And because I have a pair of them, I can run those two modulators 90 degrees out of phase for a, a polyphase electrostatic induction machine of about 10 horsepower, which is something I'm really intent on is a, uh, a polyphase electrostatic uh, induction motor. Uh, we call it the Trump motor because it was Donald Trump's uncle that developed it to have that drive a, uh, a Tesla centrifugal pump which is more commonly known as a Tesla turbine, except this will be running the other way. Uh, this could result in a, um, a complete, completely novel uh, method of, uh, of refrigeration, much more efficient and reliable than compressors and, you know, and all that kind of stuff using the, the Tesla you know, high voltage and, and high RPM technology. So this is uh, it's kind of more of a commercial venture, but but these AM transmitters will will do a number of things. Uh, I have basically I have all the equipment for a laboratory and I have all the parts, but everything is jammed in a container and I don't have any shelves or I have no way to handle the material or and so everything's kind of locked up. That's the main problem right now. And I don't know how how to get past that point. But uh, but at any rate, we do we do have some benches set up and um, and a, a few outlets to run things off of. There's no three phase for the transmitters. There's no. I basically only have four one ten circuits in the whole building. This is this is the uh, Chris Carson uh, electrostatic induction machine here. It's a project that we had uh, jointly conceived, inspired by uh, Van Tassel's Integratron, which was a giant electrostatic machine. Uh, I will point out that the Integratron of today has absolutely nothing uh, to do with any of this. And uh, it was actually uh, a common wheel front that took it away from me and Don Lockwood and stripped everything out and trashed it. So there is no more Integratron per se. But at the time that I was there, uh, it was still an active project. And I was the last engineer to take steps to actually get the Integratron working. And that's where uh, you had showed the photographs of comparing, you know, your discharge to one from there. And, and that's where I had built that as kind of a, a side thing to show people um, and, you know, to help get funding for the Integratron project in general and, and to explore it on my own and, and take this work further. But uh, 
Is that you know, Eric? I don't is have that... another forty years. That's the problem. I don't have another forty years. And and the other problem is is asymptotically the IQ level of the average American is approaching eighty. Then what are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you speak for your country on your own. <laughs> exactly. That's probably even less. Um, <laughs> is there is there progress, Eric? Is there progress on the electrostatic machine um, this year? What's that now? Is, yes, there, is there progress on the electrostatic machine? Well, right now it's just you know it's another thing. So. It's uh, it's kind of up to Aaron to take the next step at this point, but he's got plenty of other things to do. So, at any rate, right. I, work, yeah. I worked out the basic math, and we know what to do, and uh, we know what to make. Uh, the Tesla turbine end of it has already been perfected by somebody else to a remarkable degree, hmm. and so, uh, and the and the the audio modulator bay uh, is a single phase power source for one of these things. So. It's uh, that modulator can put out about one and a quarter horse. So that should be with a analog network to step the 3000 volts up to a higher voltage. It should be possible to actually get a variable capacitor to spin as a motor. I think just uh, visually and conceptually, it's like that's beyond extraordinary. No wires, no magnets, no, uh, no cores, just parallel aluminum plates. Hey, um, so as soon as uh, we're hitting a couple milestones with the uh, Tesla turbine, I don't want to go into too many details at this point. Um, there's a couple milestones we have to hit. Then at that point, that's when um, we're going back into the uh, electrostatic generator. So it's going to be a bit. We have to get we have to get through some uh, Tesla turbine stuff first, which um, we've made a lot of progress. What we have is absolutely beautiful, and we're doing some generator tests and stuff like that. Not with the electrostatic generator, but with just, you know, electromagnetic generator just to, to have something to offer. And then once that's available, then uh, we'll look at uh, go, jumping back into the uh, Trump uh, electrostatic generator. So we know, we, we know what direction we're going with that. Um, should we... Uh, Answer any questions, Eric? We're on yeah, uh, an hour. Better get on that. Yeah, an hour twenty three minutes. We got eighty nine people. I think we've had uh, up to almost uh, ninety five people on this call, so that's that's good. So well, we the first, much, I think we pretty much covered everything that's going on from one end to the other. Yeah. Uh, did you mention what you're going to be presenting on at the next conference? That would be the Tesla four phase system. Okay, you, you did mention that. Uh, let's see. A couple people test. Uh, texted some uh, questions in the right column there. I think one of them, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing the last name, but Nicholas Sirocco, how do you know that the coil isn't transmitting a surface wave? Have you tried to simulate um, TE near field of the coil to see what the actual phase of the fields could be? I think he posted that when you were talking, Griffin. Yeah. And, uh, go ahead. Yeah. So that's kind of the one issue of a coil that whether it's transmitting Hertzian or trans, I mean, which is the transverse mode, which is more of a wasted radiation aside from what we're trying to achieve telurically, which is through the natural medium, which is the earth in this case. So. One of the ways to determine if we are receiving some type of radiated space component is to have a field strength meter or some type of detectable measuring equipment at a distance. And typically, if the coil is operating in a Hertzian mode, then this object at a distance will respond quite readily to these radiated fields. Now, in the course of my work, in which I've described to Eric in one instance, and which is now on my website, is that... A single coil, although not optimum for telur transmission, will exhibit two modes of resonance. And I've called it the dual moding effect because I could tune the coil to the Hertzian mode, which is a lower frequency, which we could otherwise call the so-called quarter wavelength mode of operation. And say a measuring equipment, including a fluorescent tube, will respond quite readily 
to say 100 watts input to the coil end and the tube for theatrical purposes will nonetheless light up at a distance of 70 feet, seven feet away. But if the coil so happens to be tuned to a higher mode of resonance, which is the series mode or the telluric mode, then coincidentally, this fluorescent tube will not illuminate even when connected to the terminal of this coil. So within the proximity of this coil, there will be virtually no radiated Hertzian component. But if you have a measuring apparatus, say a coil tuned to this longitudinal mode at no more than, say, 30 feet away, um, terminated on a small ground plane, it will respond quite readily to that telluric wave. So this is what makes this dual mode occurrence quite interesting. And this does allow us to see that there necessarily isn't a surface wave or a radiated <laughs> wave emanating off the coil when tuned correctly. So that is one of the main techniques to determine this. We'll say it's something that exists and something we have to, something we have different ways of accounting for, depending on right. each of our steps. I mean, one way you could do it if you had a, a conventional transverse uh, antenna of the equivalent band, then uh, depending if you detect something on one system and not on the other, then you've confirmed one uh, you've confirmed longitudinal or transverse mode. Uh, I know Adrian more or goes less. into more detail yeah. on his uh, longer range experiments, uh, connecting and disconnecting the ground to see what component the to see how the transverse component uh, varies. I guess. Yeah, I would. I would just say that that's right, Takasus. Um, what I would just add to there is, I mean, if you think about the the nature of the experimental setup. I mean, you've got a piece of metal above the ground and you've got a piece of metal uh, under the ground. Um, so there is going to be a ratio. <laughs> There's going to be a ratio between um, the radio wave or the Hertzian wave, as Griffin puts it, um, and the telluric wave. Um, and that proportion of that over distance um, is incredibly important. So, I mean, look, I mean, we talk about going distance. I mean, we were talking about, Eric was talking about 1,500 miles and stuff like that earlier. But if, we, if you think about the radio wave, say, in the HF band at the 160-meter amateur, if it's the right time of the day, you can send that wave all the way around the surface of the planet. And you can basically get that back on your receiver about one second later. Um, so the radio wave bouncing off the ionosphere all the way around the surface of the Earth can go, can go very far. But the experiments that we are doing is what is the proportion of the component that travels through the radio wave and the proportion that travels through the telluric wave or that which is communicated under the ground. So in other words, when we talk about surface wave, really you're talking about the radio wave. Um, mm -hmm. And there is, um, if the, when we talk about a telluric system, a telluric TMT system, as Tesla was talking about, you are basically optimizing for the telluric wave. Um, and that is not well understood. It's not a well understood at all. So, for example, when I did tests at two to eight miles, I found the telluric wave could be tuned um, to the radio wave at a ratio of five to one. So, in other words, the telluric wave is a lot stronger than the radio wave. But above that, say um, up to 30 miles, I found that the telluric wave falls off very quickly and the radio wave dominates. So the purport, you're always going to have the proportion of those two. I mean, it's always classically a question that I get asked is there's no antenna. Well, there is an antenna because you have a coil sitting above the surface of the earth. It's a piece of metal at the end of the day. Sure, I mean, it's, it, it's wound into a coil but it is still nonetheless a piece of metal. Um, and if you apply an RF um, um, from an amplifier um, to that, you are going to emit both a radio wave and a telluric wave. But it's, as Griffin said, it's the proportion of that. I mean, in the ideal situation, you want to, you want to bring that radio wave down to zero and optimize the, uh, what Eric has um, shared with us, the LND mode, the longitudinal magnetodielectric mode which is going to basically um, propagate um, uh, or displace 
as a as a telluric wave. So in these experiments, it is it is it is always measuring the ratio of those two things. So we all know um, that, for example, I mean, we could we could transmit a radio wave from the UK to the US in trans in the transatlantic project, no problem. I mean, that's not a big deal. I mean, Marconi did it um, 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 in the early in the early twentieth century. Um, but doing that, doing that where the telluric mode dominates, that's, that's something that's, that to my knowledge has never been done before. Eric, maybe you could add more, but I mean, I mean, to my knowledge, that's never been uh, established from since Tesla's time. Well, we're still, I'm, I'm inclined at this point to deal with it on a purely scientific basis and throw all theories out and just approach the whole thing with an open mind. Yeah. Um, Hertzian waves, TEM, LMD, telluric, surface wave. I'm not thinking about any of that. When, uh, you know, when early on, when I first engaged this at the RCA station in Bolinas, um, there's a definite proportionality between what's going on overground and what's going on under, underground. And what's going on overground is not necessarily electromagnetic. Take the, uh, take the AM radio in my car, okay? The AM radio in my car is connected to a, um, a somewhat specially connected antenna to eliminate interference and shunt capacitance to the car body. It's, uh, I'm looking at it. It's about maybe 20 inches long. Okay, now I'm listening to some station on, uh, let's say, 700 kilocycles. 20 inches ain't any wavelength of 700 kilocycles. It's a capacitor. In fact, if I bring my hand near the antenna, it detunes it. In fact, what I do is I deliberately keep the thing offset. The AM radio is kind of cocked inside the car so I can go down below the AM band. And the antenna is always hungry for a little more capacitance. So that way I can put like another little lead on or what have you and kind of get it set for a specific radio station. So basically the car body is the earth because the, the AM radio has a Tesla coil in it. That's how it operates. It's not an electromagnetic receiver. It's a relationship between the electrostatic capacity of the body of the car and the electrostatic elastance of the aerial, which is basically the reciprocal of the capacitance. So in any transmission system, if a coil is taken as a lump network, you know, or an analog network or what have you, has a characteristic impedance and it has a propagation constant. Now, if that propagation constant is set to be pi over two, and the um, impedance, characteristic impedance is such that the impedance of the aerial which of course is going to be strictly dielectric and the impedance of the earth, which uh, is questionable as to what exactly that will be. But if the product of those two impedances equals the square of the characteristic impedance of the coil, and you have exactly pi over two or 90 degrees from one end of the coil to the other, then this thing should take on a new life. And, and that's not easy to do. Now, it's not, one way or another, it's not electromagnetic. Nothing about any of this is electromagnetic. I'm not buying it that an 18 or 20 inch metal rod is an electromagnetic antenna. Yet when <coughs> I drive into a tunnel, the AM radio goes dead. <coughs> well, the naysayer, you know, the Einsteiners will say, well, you see, that means it picks up electromagnetically. No, it doesn't. It just tells me I lost my electrostatic uh, admittance to the ionosphere. That's all it tells me. For free space. Tesla even has that as a diagram in one of his elementary uh, articles where you have the elevated capacity, the lines of force that go to Earth, he regards as parasitic, and the lines of force that go up to space, he regards as transmissive, even though this thing's supposed to be transmitting in the ground. So consequently, you got one crowd of people that doesn't agree with another crowd of people. One crowd of people says this thing transmits to the Earth. The other crowd of people says it transmits to the air, and they're both wrong. So what do we do? 
So we are stuck with a purely scientific endeavor here in that we don't know. So I'm not going to subscribe to any surface waves, Zanuck waves, Hertzian waves, transverse waves, any of that stuff at all, because it's a trap. You got to approach this thing with a completely open mind. And, and it's the same thing with the modes. We don't really don't know which mode does what, even though you've seen that there are differences between the two. But what I found is, is these modes are strictly a function of terminal conditions. And Griffin already did the experiments. And if one end of the terminal conditions are zero or complete, you know, re complete reflection that the coil is not refracting elsewhere, the two modes join. And from my knowledge of transmission line theory and all that, particularly waveguides, uh, it's very undesirable to have any transmission system that has a multiplicity of modes, like using a neutral wire in three phase. That introduces another parasitic mode at, at three times the frequency of the power system. And that's what's ripping the whole electrical grid apart. You don't want multi-moding, you want single moding, but we really don't know which mode or what. And we still have to determine all these terminal conditions. So I think in general, you can see that this is actually a very quite involved project to come up with any absolutes, but it's doable by experiment. That's always how it's worked, by experiment. Don't get too wrapped up in the theories. Don't get too wrapped up in the math. And it's I don't fun think doing. we can have a better team. And it's I'll fun say, doing There's enough theory to move forward. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it, should, it, it's, exp uh, I don't know, just say it's expensive, yeah, it. but it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps you busy. <laughs> Should we hit some of these other uh, questions and yeah. zip through them? Okay, okay. so this is from uh, somebody whose username is iPhone. Uh, there's two of them. Uh, let's see, series phase and parallel out of phase. And that might have been when you were uh, talking earlier, Griffin. And then the second post is, is there a simple way to test to make sure you, you have a true ground and are not picking up anything stray from the power companies? You know, anybody wants to tackle that real quick? I guess with the power company one, well, if you live in a YY connected area, I mean, it's pretty evident as to just what the level of interference would be. So, I mean, one simple test just to see what the level is in your area, you could have two, you, you could establish an electrostatic potential setup where you have two ground rods separated at no more than 10 feet, have a pair of high impedance headphones connected across those terminals. And sure enough, if you usually hear the loud harmonics coming through the headphone set, then you know that there is an appreciable amount of interference. Now, typically, because these harmonics will maintain themselves in the lower part of the voice frequency band, that in this HF or high frequency area where we're operating, they still will be picked up or interfere with the received signal, but it's not exactly something that you're harvesting, I, I guess, if that's the way that question leads to of how it could interfere with the transmission or the reception of the signal. Well, there's a lot more frequencies other than the power line harmonics. With all yes, the, exactly. Uh, all the China jammers, because you have to keep in mind all, all electrical and electronic devices now <laughs> that come from China have radio jammers built into them. So that's one major problem. Uh, and if you have a wide line connection and you're not isolated from it, um, it completely invalidates all of your experiments because instead of transmitting through the earth, it's going to transmit through the primary neutral, the power line, and you're just going to be lighting up the town you're in and turning it into an antenna. In fact, uh, really? if you get the power up too high, you have to be careful that you don't fry everybody's uh, little china boxes and end up with the Department of Homeland Security on your rump. <laughs> so that 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 the why why really and that's what I got here. It really it really complicates things and requires being a lot more careful on how you do this stuff. So you have to use isolation transformers or just get away from the power utility completely. Okay, um, let's see. Let's see, Declan posted, make sure to up upvote the comment. Yeah, this is worth doing. Hey, we got 85 people on here right now. We could get 85 thumbs up on uh, Eric's comment on that uh, YouTube video. I just posted a link to it, and that, sh and that should go directly to the um, 
I think that might go directly to Eric's comment. Let me let me pause that video so it's not playing in my headset. It does. Okay, so Eric's username is normally T Rex, but this YouTube thing changed it to. Um, here, I'll just post it in the uh, chat here if it lets me copy it. That's uh, there's a little Tyrannosaurus Rex uh, little icon next to his username. That's the username. So if you click that link and go to that YouTube channel, you can uh, click read more or whatever to see his full comment. And if you click a thumbs up on it, if everybody did that all at once, hey, we got 85 thumbs up to help push that comment towards the top and get more people paying attention to it. So let's let's do that. <laughs> uh, let's see. What are the what's the next question up here? Um, just give me a second here. OK, so that addressed those. The YouTube comment. Uh, Helen is asking how electrons may have mass but don't have momentum. Example given like in a DC circuits. Does anybody want to answer that? That's kind of out of topic, but uh, I would recommend going to J.J. Thompson on that one. Electricity and Matter is his book. Yeah, that's and in the idea. Einsteinian point of view that if you have an electron technically moving at the speed of light, then it wouldn't have mass. That's in the Einsteinian point of view. So it doesn't exactly find to be so applicable to this circumstance or just really any form of transmission. Well, like the equations balance, but it's kind of schizophrenic. Right. Yeah, it's not. Well, it's just erroneous. I think it's it, it's important to to look at uh, the. I think the most important if we go back to Eric's most fundamental statements about um, quantity of electrification. It's a relationship between the magnetic induction field and the dielectric induction field. And it's easy. The most important word there is relationship. The relationship between those two induction fields defines everything that we know, um, all the characteristics that we measure and everything that we observe in terms of electricity and we haven't even scratched the surface i mean if we go and look at for example let's go back to those those golden ratio discharges there is a relationship that is going on between those induction fields um, which is critically important um, and seeing seeing electricity in that way rather than talking about um charge on the electron, um, electron flow. Um, for example, um, if you take, say, a single wire current experiment, so if you take a Tesla transformer, um, you run it at, um, let's say, um, we're using like a pancake coil, like Eric originally uh, used, let's say it's around about two megacycles. Mm -hmm. um, it's a classic experiment where you basically... Um, you can measure single wire currents. Now, normally, if you take, for example, um, a semiconductor rectifier, like a diode, um, and you put that um, in a transformer at low frequency, it's going to cause rectification. So you say uh, in, with just one diode, you get a half-wave rectification. If you put that in a single wire in a Tesla transformer, it doesn't rectify anything. It, it rectifies nothing at all. Why? Because in a single wire current mode, you're talking about the relationship between the magnetic induction field and the dielectric induction field around the wire. The wire is just like a waveguide. It's just a guide. Um, power is being conveyed um, through the relationship between those two induction fields, um, and the wire is simply acting as a guide. It is not in the wire. So... I mean, when you look at a semiconductor device, a semiconductor diode has a voltage-current relationship which requires um, um, a current. It goes in current to be flowing through it in order to, in order to satisfy the, the um, quantum mechanical reason 
the solid state reason why that diode works. And at low frequency, in, or in ordinary electrical theory, the voltage and current, it works fine. But in a Tesla transformer, it doesn't. The, 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 it's a classical experiment um, that you can do. If you put a semiconductor diode in a single wire on a Tesla transformer, there's no rectification. Because the, because the, the, the energy is not inside the wire. It's being conveyed around the wire. Okay. Eric, do you want to add more on that? Yeah, it's, uh, again, we're starting to get into, you know, there's a lot we don't know, and we're, we're, we're basically hampered by our theories. So there is a conduction mode through the wire, conceivably, and I think you had... We talked and you had done this with a 40 gauge wire or something, and there's no RF amp meter reading, the wire's not melting. Uh, That's right. Uh, Bedini, Bedini's claim to fame was a vaudeville act he came up with uh, way, way back in the my Integratron days. That would have been like the early 80s, where he allegedly had produced a semiconductor that allowed you to transmit substantial quantities of audio power through one very fine wire without heating it up or burning it out. Well, not too long ago, uh, when I was translating J.J. Thompson's material, which is a tangled, uh, convoluted mess of mathematic incongruities, uh, I found that that current actually is defined by J.J. Thompson, and it's not electric. <laughs> it's something else. There's something in the wire. It's not electrons. And he referred to it as a corpuscle. And... Uh, J.J. Thompson, even though he's credited with the discovery of the electron, once came up with a statement uh, sneering at uh, the Einsteinians that he had a toast to his colleagues and he stated, here's to the electron, may it be of no use to anybody. <laughs> and I'll end it there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, okay. Aaron, yeah, I would yeah, just, go ahead. I, I'd, I'd just like to add on what Eric was saying because there was there's an experiment that Eric referred to that I also have on my website, um, which is um, part of the um, um, transference of electric power or the high efficiency transference of electric power, where we're talking about passing a kilowatt of power through a 40 gauge piece of wire. So, um, so you have two Tesla transformers in a classic TMT configuration. Um, much like um, Eric um, originally had um, in that um, uh, famous video um, with himself, Peter Lindemann, oh, yeah. um, and Tom Brown, um, where um, you have a 40 gauge piece of wire is 0 0.08 millimeters thick. That's 80 microns, 80 microns thick. And you pass one kilowatt of power through there with no loss. How do you do that? I mean, you would call that a fuse normally. <laughs> you call it a fuse, but it, it but it doesn't blow. It doesn't blow. Why? Because um, because the power is not in the wire. It's surrounding the wire. The wire is acting as a waveguide. As soon as you disconnect the wire, there's no power from the transmitter to the receiver. Nothing. It's not. It's it's not wireless. It's not going through the air. It's not because of um, ionization. Um, um, it, when you connect the wire again, the 40-gauge wire, single strand of 40-gauge wire, one meter long, then um, you can light a one-kilowatt bulb at the, at the Tesla transformer receiver. And that's because of the relationship between the magnetic and the dielectric induction fields their relationship around the wire, not in the wire. The wire only acts as a waveguide. It was something Eric and I were talking about earlier. It's a fundamental question that we were talking about, I mean, only last month, I think, in a, in a telephone conversation. But in Telluric, the real big question is when, when the longitudinal mode is in the ground, how does it know which way to go? How does it know which way to go? <laughs> so if, if, if you put a receiver 100 miles away, 
how do you know basically that that wave is going to go or in whatever form it is lmd and eric's right to throw out the ideas of whether it's this that or the other we need to be open um to it how does it go in to the ground and then a hundred miles away it heads in the right direction and now it's going to head out the other side into the into the receiver think about that it's a it's about coherence how does coherence work how does coherence in electricity work these are very very fundamental questions that electromagnetism has no answer for at this time yet they they are real they um I mean, coherence is quite possible. Um, so over a one meter, 40 gauge, 40 AWG piece of wire, you can pass one kilowatt. And in, in, in all sense of terms, it should act just like a fuse. It should blow instantly. That is the importance of the experiment that Eric was referring, was referring to. Thanks, right. Alan, I just wanted to add. Sure. Okay, we're getting close to two hours, so we'll try to zip through these and, and quick brief answers. Uh, Flo asks, do the same patterns appear in sand with cymatic frequencies? And I think that's a question uh, when you're pointing out the golden ratio um, discharges. I know it's symmetrical from a side view, but uh, on cymatics, I've never seen an asymmetrical pattern. They're usually, you know, kind of a top view look, symmetry. I mean, look, I mean, the... the, the the golden ratio is, I mean, if we ask the question, first of all, what is the golden ratio? Um, it, is a, it is a natural order. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about the golden ratio. Um, it goes back, to be honest, I mean, if you're, if you're of that way of thinking, it goes back to Atlantean times, the golden ratio. It's been, it's been around a long time, aeons and aeons and aeons. And it is part of the a most fundamental principle. So I wouldn't be surprised um, if you can't see that natural order, that natural, I mean, there is only after all one life. There is one life and its expression, whether it be electricity, whether it be water, whether it be sand, whether it be lightning, whether it be any, any facet, it's going to be reflected um, in that. And that really, I think, is the most exciting thing that we are doing with this electricity research for me we are basically unfolding or looking to unfold um, to discover more about that natural order of the one life it's there is no other more fundamental question so i would be surprised if it if it isn't reflected in sand um, it must be reflected um, if it's in one place it's everywhere you only have to look hard enough in order to find it. The somatics uh, is a standing wave pattern where the golden ratio discharge is actually a function of itself. Oh, that's so interesting. They're not, they're not really, they're not interchangeable because the, um, the somatics thing is actually a waveguide moment, so to speak. So when you vary the frequency, it goes through all these you know, peaks and nodes and what have you, where the, the golden ratio discharge is tapping something that's intrinsic in the ether or whatever you might want to call it. So they're not, they're not, there's, there's not an equivalence there, but there is an equivalence in that when lightning, uh, massive lightning discharge strikes a sand dune and you go out there and clear all the sand away from it, you will have a frozen version of one of these golden ratio discharges. They're called fulgurites. You can look them up on uh, YouTube. I knew a guy that went out and collected those there in Lone Pine, hunt for the blast spot and dig the things out. They're actually worth a lot of money. Okay. Uh, let's see. Helen asks, while feeding an AC signal with a visual, visual spectrum frequency through a coil, can you get to see this magnetic field with this visible frequency? I don't understand that. Not, you could yeah, see, sure. I think I get what they're saying, Doug. I mean, you could visualize the the magnetic field by use, I mean, partially by using some type of magnetic pickup. I mean, unless you're employing an oscilloscope, then, then yeah, that's all possible. Not, yeah, exactly sure what the question is asking. 
it is a, it is. I know I follow up, Griffin, from what you're saying. It's um, mm -hmm. it's an astute question in a way. I mean, if you're asking, how do you visualize the relationship between those induction fields? That's something that is something of active research. That is something that we are trying to do. I mean, that is that is the whole point in a way of uh, there's the whole purpose of researching uh, the golden ratio discharge um, is is to be able to understand what that relationship. I mean, if you go back to the quantity of electrification, in other words, the relationship between the magnetic and the dielectric induction fields, that dot, that dot in between those two is is actually a whole relationship. It is a whole dimensional quality that hasn't actually been explored. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if that is the question you're asking, then, then there is a great deal of work that needs to be done. I mean, we don't understand much at all about the relationship between those two induction fields. Um, as, as per the, the, the previous example that Eric gave um, and that I elaborated on with the, with the 80 micron the 80 micron wire, you know, it should be a fuse, but it's not. It's actually an excellent uh, conductor of electrification uh, with 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 no loss. Okay. Uh, let's see, Stephen Gielo, and I'm, I'm not sure if that's how your last name is pronounced. Um, Eric, are you using the Lukowski MWO? And, and Eric does also have an oscillation transformer to allow you to run it in a balanced mode. Um, but there, uh, we, uh, we did bring an MWO down there, I think, in January, maybe. Yeah, I don't use it myself, but um, I put other people in it that seem to be having problems. It's, uh, you know, it's set up to turn on and go, so, but I myself have, have not been regularly utilizing it. So this is the uh, MWO, for anybody who doesn't know, invented by George Lakovsky. And we're one of three manufacturers in the world who are making the real thing based on the uh, reverse engineering report from the Italian um, engineers. Um, we're actually taking pre-orders right now for uh, the next batch due to be completed in March, April timeframe. And there's only about 10 more left. Or ten spots remaining for the pre-order, and I just posted a link if anybody's interested in that. Okay, let's see. Yo, just scanning through these texts here. Normally, we open up on the uh, conference calls. We just unmute people and they ask, but since people have been posting or te texting, typing these in the chat, I'm just re reading these out of here. Do you want to do you want to unmute Aaron also let people just ask? Uh, I can. Uh, I, I might as well zip through some of these real quick since they're um, already here. Okay, Helen asks: Are there any informational features of the ether, like information field? You know, like this morphic field type concept that Gustav Le Bon originally talked about, and that like Rupert Sheldrake was made popular for, for that terminology, even though it came from Gustav Le Bon. Well, Information that's what we, in the that's ether. What seeing in the discharges. Mm -hmm. That's what gives the discharges their golden ratio shape. So uh, yeah, by agree. definition, the golden ratio is a log base, by the way. So you could yeah. call it a natural logarithm, even though that word's been used for other things, but it's a log base. So it's a progression. It's how things progress or regress it's proportionality between elements that makes for excellent uh, antenna performance by the way for log periodic antennas and uh eric has covered a lot of that about those log periodic antennas in a presentation in 2015 called uh power of ether and that's uh if anybody wants to look at that's a very interesting presentation that covers a lot of stuff um, power of ether and you can find that presentation in uh, emediapress.com uh, let's see
Oh, and I wanted to mention on eMedia Press right now, um, all the way until January 1st, midnight uh, Pacific time here, there is a 30% off coupon at the bottom of the screen. So if you use that, you can apply that in the um, uh, shopping cart and I'll take 30% off all digital downloads. Uh, let's see. Nick to everyone that, and I'm not sure what context this is in or who is speaking during this time. Um, that doesn't discount a surface wave propagation across the earth. Surface waves have uh, surface waves have longitudinal propagation, even in conventional physics. Any surface wave will travel incredible distances, but the coil could be a launcher. That's quite Anybody possible. Make... Yeah, I think, okay. I, I think we covered that. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, let's see. Wouldn't telluric transmission harm the plants? Doesn't seem to. No. Well, plants respond uh, quite readily and beneficially from my electroculture research to high voltage, high frequency alternating current. And I have seen people use high potential DC, but of course, I guess for the novelty aspect, it still has to be researched some more, but it seems as though high frequency is quite beneficial. So it wouldn't necessarily harm anything. Or at least it doesn't kill. Well, yeah. I mean, of course, if you're in direct contact with it, then you could get a nasty radio frequency burn. But of course, that's a whole different topic in itself. I know that plants go crazy when they're around the MWO, whether it's right. in the Lakovsky unbalanced mode or the balanced mode. And you should see Paul Babcock's little man cave where he, where he has a, a MWO in there. All the ivy and all this stuff from around it is all growing up on it and is coming and surrounding the window trying to get to that MWO. Because ah. he had one coil burn out, but while it was running, he had it on a timer that would automatically come on. And literally all the plants are trying to move and gravitate <laughs> right to their reaching it, reaching out to it. Um, let's see. Right, Hakusa. Would, yeah, right, go ahead. I'll just, I'll just add there. I mean, if we go... If we go back and we look consider telluric, I mean, telluric is, in itself is of the earth. Um, so we are, we are, Tesla talked about uh, bringing, uh, attaching our, our machines and ourselves to the wheel work of nature. This is about coherence. So the only time that telluric is ever really going to work when it's actually in tune, when we're actually attaching our machines to the wheel work of nature. That was something that was really, really important. Um, this is the same that we're talking about with the, with the, uh, with the golden ratio um, discharges. Um, it is, it is, this is not something that we are imposing on the earth. This is something to come in tune. So in other words, the only way that we're actually going to solve the riddle, if you call it, if you could call it that way, or solve the mystery, that piece of the mystery, which is what is the telluric transference of electric power, or what is telluric uh, uh, communication, or however you term to put it, is when we actually bring our experiments in tune with the natural process if in tune with a natural telluric process so sure i mean you can you can blast all kinds of currents into the ground and everything like that um the earth fortunately is able to absorb quite a lot by the looks of it um but th the experiments are only really going to work when we actually learn how to uh be in tune with that natural harmony the natural order. And that's why it's so important to understand what are the principles of natural order. That's the whole point of the research, the telluric research, the, the, the um, golden ratio discharge research. It's all about understanding and coming in tune with the natural order. Okay. Okay, somebody this question. Somebody just asked a question whether. Uh, the lightning uh, overground is related to something underground. And uh, I got in this at Landers because I have the necessary facilities. And that is a matter of fact. There is, as what is it that saying? As below, so it will be above or something yep. like that. As above, so below. Yeah. 
It's definitely, yeah, uh, definitely the, the case. Lightning will go into places that by, according to the laws of electrostatics, there's no way lightning would strike it yet. Yet it does. You know, it, it'll hit some low spot when, you know, it could have a 200 foot radio tower, you know, a quarter mile away to strike and it won't go near that tower, but there's something that it likes in the ground. And I actually measured uh, conjugate lightning storms above and below the ground in landers in some of these crazy monsoonal weather systems that come out there that, that defy description, not alone the electrical sounds that make. Tornadoes are the same way. There's an underground and overground, and it's, that's why it's got that conical shape, because there's a conjugate conical underneath the ground. And those things are incredibly electrically active. You can pick, they have a characteristic signature on a telluric receiver very similar to that of volcanoes, just like uh, earthquakes have a very distinct signature, very similar to hurricanes. So the, the hurricane sound is a frying, snapping type of thing where the, uh, the tornado and the volcano is more of a burping and farting type of sound. Okay. Okay, here's a question from Declan. Uh, this is directed to you, Eric. Uh, he's heard you talk, uh, mention that you've held uh, Victor Schauberger's work in high regard, a brief mention on one of these calls a few years back in which uh, you put him on par with Tesla. Have you ever envisioned blending the natural sciences of Schauberger and Tesla into a workable model? I haven't uh, heard, uh, he hasn't heard you talk much about Schauberger in any great detail. And uh, could you expand on what you learned from him, if anything? Well, there's not really a lot available because it's just kind of, you know, brief passages and a few diagrams here and there. It's kind of hard to really come up with anything on the engineering level from the work of Victor Schauberger. But, uh, you know, his uh, explanations and, uh, and his accounts of things that he saw in nature are... Uh, at least they're enough to, to get you to start thinking about stuff. That's what's important. Okay. The this other is one, from, who is that guy? Um, oh, Walter Russell. Walter Russell is another one that, uh, you know, the academians hate his guts because of all his weird drawings and pictures, but uh, he's the one that came up with the conjugate tornado diagram. I think I even used it in one of my presentations. So all these guys add their you know, their kind of uh, flavor to the general subject and, and help with the overall understanding, but not on the engineering level. In fact, even Tesla didn't help as much with the engineering level. Uh, his, he left it pretty much to other people to figure out exactly how he did things. And of course, because it was a capitalistic or a commercial enterprise he was involved in, you know, naturally, he's not going to tell everybody just how to go out and do things particularly being, you know, that Westinghouse, you know, and him had patent relations and what have you. So Tesla actually stated that, uh, that he was a discoverer and he would leave the, uh, the details to others. And probably one of the most important others is Steinmetz, of course. Without Steinmetz, we would have never been able to uh, harness alternating current. Okay. Um, let's see. Do you know of Christian, Christian Berkland of Norway about 1896 research on the sun, earth, northern lights, electrical connection? I've heard about it. I think it's something called the Berkland currents. Mm -hmm. I think it's an interplanetary current, but uh, I don't know that much about it. Yeah, that gets into the whole uh, space, electrical space kind of models. I saw that for Bruce uh, Laybourne. Uh, had logged into the call here. Um, well, that's what's, going on. That, that's what's going yeah. on in the cosmic light bulb. That's what mm -hmm. makes the cosmic light bulb project so interesting is mm -hmm. we actually are duplicating the process of the cosmos mm -hmm. in a bulb. So much for these giant particle accelerators. What are well, they that is the, well, that is the reflection that as is above is below. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, Eric, uh, would you, let's see. Oh, okay. Somebody's just asking if you're open to going on these other uh, podcasts. 
or uh yeah conceivably other, um, other online kind of radio show kind of deals yeah i don't yeah. i have a uh uh kind of constraint here is that, that i'm violating right now uh only because you're in control of the situation is uh this computer is strictly used as a television and not uh i will not engage in it in any kind of uh social media i will use the telephone but but I will not use the computer except for this rare exception because that's why I don't have any trouble with it is because I don't mm -hmm. get connected to things, links mm -hmm. and all that stuff. It's strictly, yeah. strictly a TV. Yeah. I think a lot of them, you call, call in with a regular telephone as well. Um, yeah, that, that would work. Then I'm up so to it. Hello from Hawaii. Um, Eric, how much money do you need to complete the laboratory there? Like the inside of the building, electrical and, and that kind of well, stuff. We're trying to get the estimate. Uh, I think uh, because I have the money to pay Justin, he's going to come down here and it's going to be too cold to do much attentive work. So I think we'll come up with a concrete estimate, but I would say probably $125,000. That's about how much it took to get the building so that it keep the rain and snow out and the front wall wouldn't fall in and, uh, and what have you. And at least I have the music listening room that I can keep warm and uh, sleep at night, despite the fact that I'm living on a interstate uh, highway here. I'd say that 125 K would be a good estimate. I know we could really get ahead with that. Okay. Uh, let's see from Kay Anderson. Um, how do you push or pull against the ether? Good question. <laughs> I'll just <laughs> now, let, let me point out that let's get this ether thing uh, hashed out here uh, because that's really an incredibly misused term. And uh, I agree. You mentioned that presentation. Uh, the power of the ether is related to music and electricity. Uh, Basically, uh, the ether is the primordial medium of creation and it has no physical existence. It's a, actually metaphysical. It's the, um, the end process of the process of creation, starting from the spiritual level. I think it's the fifth step down. Mm -hmm. um, that's why all that 19th century mechanical ether models of Maxwell and Lord Kelvin and all that stuff is, uh, ether is, is best regarded as the genie in the bottle and be careful what you ask it. <laughs> be careful what you wish for <laughs> <laughs> i would just i would just add to what eric is um saying is that i think the best that any of us can do is work towards becoming in sync in sync with with uh whatever is the ether yeah and and your ability you know to bring your senses to the point that you can see what's around you that's uh that's something that's been beaten out of almost anybody mm. I, I mean, what, what I see around me would frighten other people. It's uh, something that my friends call dollar vision, and it can be acquired, uh, but you won't like what you see. It's animals have that ability. You know, it's people will wonder why a dog will growl at one person and not the other person, even though there's no visual evidence for that. But uh, there's something that animals have a, a, a sense or a sensibility that... Uh, that socialization and what have you, particularly this day and age, has uh, erased from us. But uh, but I, I never uh, really joined in with any of that. I'm a feral human, so I have not lost those abilities to the extent that most people have. And of course, there are famous people that have very high levels of sensitivity that see all kinds of stuff. Uh, the only problem is it might make you go insane. If I were to... Aaron, if I could just add, um, sure. if I were to equate the ether, if I could, for a moment to the one life, uh, which is something we, which is, if we can call it the great mystery, then coming into sync with the one life is, is all of our tasks. However we do it, um, that is the one purpose. That is all well, about one, one good however we do it. To, one good way to get into it is start listening to Bach organ music. That's what it's designed to do, is phase you in. Indeed. Indeed. 
remember Tesla's um, greatest statement, um, or be I believe his greatest statement is is um, to bring our machines, our lives um, um, into co into cooperation with the one life, essentially. In my own words, so. Okay. Uh, let's see. Berkland th theorized that Northern Lights was electricity from sunspots hitting the Earth, which uh, ticked off the Royal Society and Lord Kelvin, who at the time believed space being a vacuum. Are we electrically connected to the sun? Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. of course. <laughs> of course. Well, and even other natural processes that occur on Earth. So in the realm of seismic forecasting, this holds to be true that typically the activity of the sun will have some influence on the tectonic plates and other interworkings of the earth as a whole. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm just trying to bring up a uh, presentation here on the website from the conference. Um, let me just show this real quick for anybody interested in the uh, space weather kind of stuff. <laughs> I'd recommend getting this, uh, presentation by Bruce uh, Leborn and David Johnson, Stellar Transformer Concepts, Applications, and Monitoring Methods. And they go uh, pretty heavy into a lot of these uh, uh, space, uh, electrical space type uh, concepts. Uh, there's, a, there's a book that uh, is strictly a popular book. It's not scientific or uh, theoretical uh, that helped me a lot, even though a lot of people don't like it. Um, is called uh, the Jupiter effect. And that is, uh, it was kind of a doomsaying book about the, that particular solar cycle, one that I studied when I was at Sonoma State, it was going from 21 to 22, cycle 21 to 22. And, uh, and even though it didn't destroy the earth, uh, that book held true. That particular solar cycle, all the planets lined up on October 13th of 1980. And it knocked the sun silly. And uh, some of the magnetic storms that occurred as the solar rotations kept carrying these spots around were so strong that actually uh, it caused the Earth to wobble on its orbit. So uh, for people that aren't into theories, uh, just kind of uh, observational facts and, and references to uh, things, uh, the, uh, I would recommend reading The Jupiter Effect. And it, and it might be worth mentioning cosmic patterns. Can you can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead, Scott. If we can keep it brief, we're on two, two hours, 20 minutes. So I want to maybe get this wrapped up here in about the next uh, 10 minutes. But yeah, go for it's it. It's a brief question. It's almost a yes or no question. Sure, go for it. Um, it's been suggested that the upper boundary of a traveling disturbance through the ether uh, is not the speed of light in terms of longitudinal waves. And but uh, this uh, pi over two times the speed of light for that velocity. Does anyone here think that's an upper boundary for the speed of a uh, traveling disturbance in the ether? Uh, I can't no, answer that no, one way or another. No, it's not an upper boundary. I mean, it depends which perception you 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 coming from. I mean, if you put, if you look at, if you, if you want to look at the perception, the common perception, C, the speed of light is only the, is only the speed of light in the, within the common perception. Um, that is in the form. Um, so in other words, if we work in form now, um, then C, um, is the speed of light, but that's only based on a common perception. If you move out of the common perception, then the speed of light will be something else. So, sure, I mean, the propagation speed um, outside of the boundaries, uh, those boundaries, is, is, is more than possible. But it's not possible in form. But it's well, possible. Mark, what, I found, what I found mathematically is uh, what we're dealing with is not a velocity at all. In fact, uh, that was uh, the premise of my uh, presentation, uh, electrical transmission through multiple coordinate systems. It doesn't necessarily have to be a ratio of time 
for space to time and velocity, it could be uh, the product of space and time. And that works out, uh, dimensionally it works out. So the, the speed of light thing is, uh, is a Maxwell-Einstein uh, trip up, basically. And all it really is is the ratio, it represents the ratio of electromagnetic units to electrostatic units. There is no real velocities involved here. The velocities are, um, are fictitious. They're, they're kind of like a phantom. They're not actually what's really going on. They're more of a side effect. Okay. Did that answer your question, Scott? Okay, I think that wrapped it up. I think Scott. Uh, um, yeah, the speed of light in a transverse wave, as opposed to longitudinal wave. Uh, Tesla made this quotation: pi over two times the speed of light in transverse is the speed of light in a longitudinal wave. And if there is a difference, then would that indicate that what Eric was saying in terms of measurement or in terms of whatever means is supposed to determine a velocity would that be consistent meaning would would there be an would that indicate an upper boundary in a longitudinal wave or not it's basically a yes or no question no there's no there's no relationship the, the velocity is an extraneous uh, uh dimensional uh quantity or you know, numeric or whatever you want it to be in this case. There's no, the pi over two is basically a, uh, a group velocity relationship in the Tesla transmission yep. where one end is yep. the velocity of light and the other end it's infinite. And, and the proportionality between those two is pi over two. Uh, the only other pi over two was uh, Wheatstone, Professor Wheatstone, Oliver Heaviside's uncle, claims that he measured the propagation velocity of longitudinal electrostatic conduction to be pi over two times the velocity of light. And it seems like Herman Helmholtz was in agreement with him on that, but, um, but there's no, uh, there's no real constraints here. It can be, you can go any which way with these things by adjusting the conditions involved and it's best to stay away from clinging to velocity because it's, the velocity is not really directly what's happening. It's more of a side effect. So, so basically there is no limit and pi over two or C itself, are not, they're not absolutes by any means. Very oh, good. Just, That's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah, it's not an upper boundary. So the answer you're in essence saying is no. Well, That's correct. I, I would add Scott, it's not a, uh, it's not a yes, no answer. <laughs> hey so hey yeah i think this uh zoom call worked out pretty good what do you think eric there's still 73 people hanging on so kind of late in europe so people had to log out but uh yeah well i'm kind of fading out so i think okay. uh, i think we've gone as far as practical i mean we could go you know probably to midnight but uh, sure <laughs> we, we, we need to do these more often and we would yeah. like to go. We would yeah, like we'll to get, go to midnight. We'll get these. We'll get <laughs> these going. Time. Yeah, we'll get these going on a regular basis. You know, at least once a month, um, po possibly even maybe every other week or something. You know, or more often. It just depends on what's going on. But I think this format worked pretty good. It's uh, I'm kind of getting the hang of how, how to use this thing. And uh, um, yeah, if you're able to support uh, uh, again, anybody. Uh, you, to support EPD Laboratories Inc. by going to um, ericpdollar.com, scroll down in the right column, and and if anybody's able to donate by uh, PayPal or by mail, it'd be greatly appreciated. I know that uh, uh, Griffin also has a donate link on his website, and you can see with all the builds he's doing, you know, all, all the money and all the donations definitely goes to uh, furthering the work in this area. And uh, we'll give we'll I'll be giving some uh, uh, updates. As far as the uh, upcoming conference, uh, I will be listing uh, uh, Dr. Marsh as a presenter, as well as uh, Eric, myself, uh, most li likely Haka says, and uh, uh, Griffin. And uh, again, it'll be a five-day conference coming up in July. 
Um, we'll probably start opening up for tickets early uh, January rather than waiting till I have a full uh, schedule uh, figured out. And also we will be offering the uh, Vimeo live streaming tickets for those who are unable to travel or in case there are any crazy travel restrictions going on. And um, as soon as this is over, I'll, I'll get this uh, edited and put up on uh, uh, YouTube. And so if you logged out earlier and you wanted to see the rest of it, you'll be able to see that. So any final uh, comments, Eric? No, I think the subject is fairly well exhausted for now. Yep. Okay. So, <laughs> hey, thanks for your time, Eric and uh, uh, Dr. Marsh. Uh, Griffin Haka says everybody on the call, thank you so much. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Whatever you happen to uh, celebrate. And uh, this being the 17th, we'll probably uh, see you all uh, next year. <laughs> Okay. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Thank you, everybody.